this computer. Here we go. Okay, we are recording. And I think we are starting with our paper from um, the Chago Sarp Archipelago, aren't we? Yes. yes. On coconuts, coconuts. Yes. We're going co and I am co one of those. I am one of those that did not sleep last night. So <laughs> I'll keep pouring coffee and stay with me. I might throw an Italian word every so often just because my brain is half, uh, half gone. But yes. I think yes. we should just do it in Italian one day and we can try and interpret what you're saying. I think that might be. I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we we've got uh, we've got Peter with us this morning. Do we have any of the other other co-authors with us here? I'm gonna try, ask you to unmute yourself there, Peter. Here we go. Good morning. Good morning. Hello, Peter. Good How morning. are you? Uh, very well. Yeah, it's a bit grey and damp and um, miserable in uh, in England here. So situation normal. Situation normal. <laughs> Uh, well, also, also here, we got a bit of rain last night, and uh, I was actually very happy because I have started my own, uh, my own garden, so I am planting some courgettes and aubergines, so I was happy for some rain, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> All right, <laughs> science, serious, okay. Um, okay, so we are today with, uh, with a paper from, uh, from Peter and, uh, and co-author, and uh, the paper presented the uh, focuses on the problem of highland restoration, in particular, uh, tropical uh, um, oceanic uh, seabird islands, uh, which are ecologically degraded due to the introduction of mammalian predation and habitat dest destruction. So uh, with the higher rates of uh, endemism and uh, relative isolation, these islands uh, have incurred 61% of all documented extinctions and currently support 37% of all critically endangered species. Seabird highlands uh, have been severely degraded by human activities worldwide due to deforestation and the introduction of invasive species like rats and cats, uh, which are the uh, greatest threat to global seabird population. So um, there have been uh, effective uh, eradication pro uh, programs uh, um, that have led to improved condition on seabird islands, but uh, predatory eradication may not necessarily lead to recoloni recolonization and the ecosystem recovery because uh, um, of the availability basically of suitable breeding habitats. And uh, there are basically ecological factors like distance to, to source population, meta population dynamics, philopathy strength, reproductive rates and competitions that we actually also need to uh, consider. So uh, we go to the uh, tropical Indian and Pacific Ocean. Um, well, basically the introduction of invasive mammals and the clearance of native vegetation for, fo for coconut plantations caused a severe habitat degradation. With the demise of coconut farming, basically the plantation were abandoned and actually to date, more than 50% of the trees have been classified, that have been abandoned, the coconut trees, uh, have been classified as unproductive. So clearly, even if the mammals are eradicated, the ecosystem needs management on the vegetation as well as so the new uh, recovery uh, plan. So in this paper, uh, Peter and colleagues focus on, isla, on the islands in the uh, Chagos archipelago in the central Indian Ocean. Uh, as previously said, uh, some of the islands within the archipelago were subject to mammalian invasion, harvesting and clearance uh, of native habitat for coconut plantations. And uh, except for one island, uh, which had a transient, which has a transient uh, military population, all islands are um, uninhabited. So, um, the highlands not farmed for coconut are uh, in a near natural uh, vegetative state and uh, also rat free and also like were set as basically targets for the highland restoration projects. So in the uh, Chagos uh, archipelago, the authors quantify the hypothetical potential increase in breeding seabird numbers uh, with and without a conversion of abandoned coconut plantation for breeding seabirds habitats post rat uh, eradication. 
um, seabirds breeding habitats were defined and uh, their availability were measured on every island. Um, they uh, recorded, the authors recorded the number of seabird species and their abundance and uh, used the resource selection modeling to uh, identify species specific preferred nesting habitats. So here we are considering data that have been gathered from a period between 2008 and 2018. And as my first question for, for Peter, I, um, I would like to, um, to know um, about uh, the story basically of this project and how basically you uh, um, handed up <laughs> in such an amazing place. Um, and so how did you uh, thought about targeting basically the, uh, this specific archipelago? Okay, um, so I first went to the Chagos Archipelago in 1996. Um, my background is I'm not a scientist. Uh, I was a commando and special forces uh, operator. And I went to the Chagos Archipelago in, in 1996 and sat on a pier uh, in Diego Garcia where the military base is. And there was a northerly wind blowing and I saw for the first time in my life, um, visible migration. I, I, I'm an ardent conservationist, an ardent bird watcher, by the way. Uh, and, and there were maybe um, hundreds of red-footed boobies and sooty terns and uh, wedge-tailed shearwaters flowing past this pier. And I instantly fell in love with the Chagos. And I said to myself that there's a military base here and if I can't get a job on that military base, <clears throat> then, then I'm not worth my salt. <laughs> and I, it, it depends how deep you want to go into this. You know, I can either do the science side or I can do the human side of it. So I'll, I'll do the human side at the moment. And, <laughs> and I got myself drafted, which is a term for getting a job in the military, into the part of the Royal Marine Commandos that, that post people to places around the world. And I specifically got that job. I didn't like it, I didn't want it because it was a desk job and I was a, a, a forward operator. Um, and uh, worked in this office specifically so I could um, work in Diego Garcia in my next job. Because if you work in the drafting office, you can pick your next job. And I worked in there for two years. It was hell on earth for me as, as an office job. Um, and instead of going to Diego Garcia, I got married. So that took me to any chance of going out there. Ten years later, um, by which time I'd gone up several ranks, uh, I was a commissioned officer. Um, I did end up on Diego Garcia as the British representative or the military British re representative out there. And that gave me the opportunity to visit every island. All, all, um, there, there's a bit of a debate how many islands there are out there. I, I say there's 55, uh, and I say that I've been on all 55 islands. Um, and uh, if you go back to 1996, um, I, I led, the, the British military is a strange, institution and it allows people to lead expeditions and it funds expeditions so uh, I applied to the British military to take a bunch of my bird watching friends uh, to Diego Garcia to do bird surveys and amazingly um, they said, yeah, that's that's cool, you can do that. I mean, that. that's a dream. <laughs> Who would <them> go? <laughs> And, and, and over the course of three exhibitions over 10 years from, from 96 to 2006, I think we found 33 new bird species um, for the territory, which is, which is no great thing. It just means people are bird watching there who know what they're doing. And, and I think there's a, there's a gentleman there. Uh, I can see that I know from eBird has seen a couple of new species out there as well. So, yes, that's you. Uh, yeah, um, and, 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 and I ended up as the second in command of the island um, 
going out on the, and that allowed me to run the patrol schedule for the bio patrol vessel. So, so uh, once a month, I would take that ship and go around every island in the archipelago. Uh, and whilst doing anti-poaching patrols and all the military aspects, I, I uh, sort of started surveying all the islands of the archipelago, counting the, the breeding seabirds. And I had no idea that when I left the military some in 2011, um, that, that the ZSL organization would offer me a PhD uh, and, and we would start publishing some of the seabird data. And, you know, and I'm sure you know that Nick Graham and I have got together and put together some stuff about <laughs> The difference between rats. So, so it, it I, I've just stumbled my way through counting birds in the Chagos, and it's all led to good things. Fantastic, fantastic! I was that not is, expecting uh, this <laughs> story. <laughs> yeah. that a, that's fantastic. Yeah, that's pretty wild. I gotta say. All right, all right, okay. I'll continue a bit on the um, on the sciencey bit. So, um, in your paper, uh, the results uh, from the habitat modeling are showing that uh, um, seabirds selected mainly, basically, natural habitats with very weak selection for or um, selection against the breeding in the non-native forests. So, in the parts of the islands where there were like the coconut uh, uh, plantation. So. Um, and from here, basically, you started to explore the concept um, of like uh, of the seabird habitat restoration because of the lack of sea breeding of sea breeding uh, habitat. It is highly unlikely to um, to have a full recovery of the seabird driven ecosystem. So, um, can you tell us basically? Um, the different habitats that you have encountered on these islands and what are the challenging for actually putting plan the restoration for for them okay um so so while all, all the islands in the chagos are young they're only about six thousand years old they're all it's not like an amazon rainforest and, and i know i'm I, I know I'm talking to people who know about oceanic islands, but <clears throat> if I if I describe a Chagos island, there there are uh, an island that doesn't have what I call coconut chaos. Mm. That means an island that's had all its native vegetation cut down and it's wall to wall coconuts. And in the 25 years I've been visiting the islands of the Chagos, I've seen two pairs of red-footed booby breeding in coconuts. I can walk around, I can walk around the island of Garcia, which is an inhabited island, and, and, and as you know, most seabirds don't really like breeding on islands where there's people. I can get 40, 50 pairs of red-footed booby breeding in takamakas or, or fish poison tree, which is Alphala Milophyllum and Barringtonia asiatica. And I, I used to take visitors out to these islands and, and we would leave the mother craft and go in a small craft and drive towards these islands. And I would say, do you think that island has seabirds or do you think that island has rats and do you think that island was farmed for coconuts? And they say, well, how do I know? And I, I would say, look above it. And, and every island that had coconuts and rats there, there might be one pair of common white tern, or there might be one uh, red-tailed tropic bird. Whereas if we were going to islands like the Three Brothers, which, which have never been farmed for coconuts and, and have no rats, if you go there in the morning, one, one morning I took, I took um, one of the British um, members of parliament that came over to visit us, and he said, um, uh, you know, Commander Carr, that, that, that island's on fire. And I said, no, sir, that is a spiral of seabirds leaving that island at dawn. And, and, and it literally was frigate birds just rising up on thermals. And they go straight up. And, and, and there were lesser noddies and brown noddies just leaving at an angle at the side. And, and there were red-footed boobies that that just leave like rapier missiles from these islands. And, and there were probably 
10 to 15,000 seabirds leaving this island with his four hectares. And, and, and it was at that point that I knew that, that and, uh, you know, again, I'm saying I wasn't involved in science 15 years ago. I was a Royal Marine commando. And, and I knew that something was wrong with these islands, that, that these islands that had been farmed for coconuts, that had, had all their native forests cut down, had, had, to, had to be restored. Uh, and I wandered off target there, so I really do apologise. What was your question? And I'll go back. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> you are there. You are there. No, I was actually wondering how uh, the question was like, how expensive basically it is going to be uh, if you set up the plan to actually um, go on with your restoration. Is it going to be an expensive plan? Can you do it all or you need to do it just part of it? Yeah, I, 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 I think... Um, I, wrote, I wrote about 15 years ago that ecological restoration in the Chagos archipelago, and if I cry here, excuse me, um, it's not a green dream. It, it's a matter of political will. And Absolutely. Yeah, and it's easy as that. And, and the great thing is um, that... that my, my PhD in the last four years work we've done tracking seabirds in the Chagos has been funded by this incredible organization called the Bertarelli uh, Program of Marine Science. And, and I have a bid in with them at the moment that I'm waiting for a decision back that one of the atolls is called Peros Banos. It's in the Northeast. Uh, and the right hand side of that atoll is a strict nature reserve uh, and uh, only three of the islands have rats there because they were large enough um, to have coconut plantations on. So I have a bid in at the moment to, to with the Bertarellis to clear all of the rats and significantly, and going back to the paper that you're talking about, we, we want to do an experiment um, in altering the coconut chaos back to native habitat. So, so we want to restore native forest and, 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 and on these oceanic islands, as I'm sure you all know, you don't just need a uh, forest, you need these open clearings for things like brown boobies and sooty ferns and stuff like that. So I've got one, one bid in with them to do uh, uh, Northeast Peros Panos. We've got another bid going in soon to go back to an island called Eagle Island, which if any of you follow rat eradications, you'll know in 2006, there was an unsuccessful rat eradication, but that was back in the days when they wasn't quite sure, you know, how these things work. We've got another bid going in for that, but, but I would lay my, my life on the fact that, that someone, because it's so obvious that, that, the Chagos is, it's uninhabited, you know, there's 54 islands or 55 islands there. We won't do Diego Garcia because that's a biosecurity threat, but there's 30 islands there that all it needs is a bit of money to do that. And with seabirds declining globally, with, 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 with so many other problems that we can restore this, this habitat in the central Indian Ocean that, that can be this source of seabirds for everywhere else that has human pressures on it. It, it just makes so much sense that I, you know, I, just, I just can't believe someone won't pick up the tab for that. Maybe I'm, you know, maybe I'm like naive or whatever, but that, that, that's how I'm living my day-to-day -day life <laughs> at the moment. Well, I love it. I love it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so I'll give it to, to Grant uh, or to the audience if there are any other questions. I have, a, I have other questions because I mean, you, Peter, have started what I actually wanted to talk about uh, uh, next, but uh, I'll, leave, uh, I'll leave the floor a little bit uh, if there are any questions. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, Peter, I got to say that is that was a, an unexpected story. That's uh, that was quite cool. So it's really nice to hear about that. I got so I have a real uh, maybe a simple question, but if let's say for example you decided to just um, remove rats, obviously the issue is then they don't have any breeding habitat. But what if you just left the rats and had the breeding habitat? Like which one could you prioritize if you only had a certain amount of money available to you? Which one would be more important, the habitat or the rats? 
I, I, I think unquestionably rats. Um, habitat can change over time, I believe. Uh, the the Chagos has, has been uninhabited for, for about 45, 46 years. And, and seabirds, I, I've watched over the last 30 years, uh, Peros Banos, this atoll is a good, good example, that, that on the tipped of these islands, there are still vestiges of uh, native habitat, Takamathias and Barringtonias, and, and red-footed boobies, I've watched them sort of go down these islands over 25 years, so they are recolonizing. Um, but, but the habitat won't change. The coconuts can't go away, but, but seabirds can't return, apart from red-footed boobies, which are, which are rat resistant, um, while rats are still there. So, so to answer your question, rats are the highest priority. But if you want to return a seabird island, you also have to manage the vegetation after. But, but rats are the first thing that have to go. Yeah, right. Je Jenny Daltrey has turned her camera on and is raising her hand, so I assume that means she's got a question. <laughs> I do, and this is absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for doing this um, talk today. Um, I just wanted to, uh, Peter, thank you very much. I, I kind of agree that, that rats are really important. I conducted the evaluation of the unsuccessful Eagle Island uh, rat eradication. I was, I was there, I think, in 2006. And I think I just wanted to flag that the, the conclusions I came to as to why it failed and why it was ultimately going to be unsuccessful in achieving its mission of helping seabirds and, and, and sea turtles was, was the fact it was basically a coconut plantation and removed, there was, there was two problems. First, probably the reason the rat eradication failed was uh, the rats just had an abundant alternative food supply. Why eat rat poison when you've got all these lovely delicious coconuts everywhere? Secondly, the the uh, antidote to the rat poison is vitamin K, which um, coconuts are really rich in. <laughs> now, what was, um, so, so we concluded, well, first of all, if you wanted to do a rat eradication again, you'd have to remove the majority of the coconuts. Um, the other thing that was really clear is that the rats were massively reduced. There were probably only two or three survivors um, that the population was all but depleted. Um, but as a result of massively reducing the rat population, there were even more coconuts because there were lots of coconuts that then germinated. And what we, we saw from the before and after photographs were a massive understory of even more coconuts coming up. So I, th I, think, I think the two have to go hand in hand, removing the coconuts and removing the rats, but probably removing the coconuts before you then tackle the rats so that you've got more hope of perhaps starting to come up with the right sort of habitat and, and a greater chance of success. But it's, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was a good lesson to me because I've, I've led, I think, 28 successful island restoration projects over in the Caribbean. But those were all on ecosystems that weren't as modified as, as Chagos was. So those did ultimately turn into natural vegetation, whereas, yeah, Chagos has to be dealt with differently. Um, I don't know if- yeah, I agree, agree Jenny. Yeah. Yeah. I agree, Jenny, and it's lovely to meet you. I, I sort of read your, read your stuff in the past. Yeah, I mean, you, 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 you won't return a seabird island and, and on most of these big islands like Eagle, unless you, unless you tackle the, the coconut chaos, um, you're going to struggle tackling the rats. Have you, thank you, pardon, have you sort of talked about how, how you might do that? I mean, I mean, obviously felling them worked to some extent. Um, the one thing I just wanted to flag though is that one of the beneficiaries of those coconut seems to be the coconut crab which is you know the robber crab which is a, a really declining endangered species and but doing really really well on those islands so um i don't know if that's been sort of factored into your thinking about um uh yeah coconut crabs um are they're a protected species in in the mm. chagos and and uh, side tracking again as i do um, it's British law out there. If you get caught eating a coconut crab, you get a one thousand five hundred pound fine. Expensive so meal. It's the most expensive crab salad you're ever <laughs> going to have in your life. Yeah. <clears throat> but 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 that aside, um, they're, they're probably at unnatural levels be, because of the coconut chaos. <laughs> so so I I spoke about this um, Bertorelli Foundation um, bid that we have. <clears throat> and, and one of the parts of the research of that um, bid 
is into coconut crabs, a, a guy called um, Mark Ladra, um, who, who's an American chap, who's probably the world authority on coconut crabs, is part of our team. Um, he's been working on Diego Garcia on coconut crabs for about the last seven or eight years. Um, he, he's looking into the coconut crab aspects of, of uh, reforesting or, or, or restoring the, the natural habitats out there. Um, but but that, that bid is for restoring four islands and how do you go about that and what impact on, on all, all of the ecosystem does knocking down coconut chaos and restoring savannah and native forest has. I'm, I'm supposed to know whether I'm successful with that bid in the next week, by the way. Um, and, and we've got people from the Seychelles, like a chap called James Millet from the Seychelles, helping us out, who I'm sure most of you know. Um, uh, uh, Q, the Royal Botanical Gardens in Kew are with us. And so, so we're looking at different ways of converting coconut chaos into native habitat, which is the most effective. What are the impacts on not, not only seabirds, but the invertebrates? Um, and, and crab species. That's cool. It's interesting because I don't think I don't think we know what's going to happen. Yeah. I, I did convert um, three areas on Diego Garcia. I took I took down three plots of ten hectare of plantations um, on Diego, and and that 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 was possibly the easiest reforestation that ever happened. Because, because literally all I did was, was knock down 10 hectare of, of uh, coconuts. Uh, and I had quite a big workforce out there and I cleared the ground of any nuts so it wouldn't sprout. And within three years, um, there was native forest up to five meters high. And I've been back, I was back there <laughs> I was back Holy there last year, and you wouldn't even know that there had ever been a coconut plantation in these places. But, you oh. know, it's just so fertile, and the seed bank is still there. You, you, you don't... Take, take, taking the coconuts off the floor is an epic. It's really hard work, and, and that's going to be the nub of the operation on the outer islands. But it... But nature will take care of itself. It, you know, it, it 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 can recover these islands. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty amazing. I guess it's kind of the advantage about having a whole workforce available to you, and you being the you being the top dog. Yeah, yeah I guess that that helps. Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for the question, Jenny. Uh, do we have any other questions from the audience while we're here? We get a few more, a few more minutes left. We could probably take a question. Nobody is raising their hands or throwing shoes. So, Mariana, if you've got another question for Peter, we can uh, we can do that and then move on to our next paper. No, we actually we have actually covered it, and my next question was like about the next steps. And Peter has uh, talked about uh, that he's waiting uh, to know uh, about his next steps. So, all good over here, and good luck, and uh, finger cr fingers crossed. Yeah, thanks very much, and you know, I'll I'll just finished by saying it's not a green dream we we can we can ecologically restore the chagos archipelago uh, and i know before i die that we will get that done that's an optimism right there i love it <laughs> thanks a lot peter that was that was fantastic um yes. all right everyone we are going to move on to our next paper and we have got a paper on life history and uh i believe francisco is unfortunately not with us today but andre is with us and uh maybe we can get it. oh there he is hello my Yay. friend nice to see you andre how are you doing today i i get you to unmute yourself oh there you go yeah yeah yep. hello how are you doing I, i'm doing well thank you thanks Good. for having me oh i have some very friendly faces there it's just you know, young there, but Akiko is on the, the blur. Oh, yes. Ah, yeah. hi, Akiko. Can you leave Akiko? Can I leave Akiko and, and Yanni on the blur? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, can, you guys, can you guys just blur your blur both of you? <laughs> so, 
So I, I say Arno there and Giselle, you know, Mariana, there's a lot of people here that. Um... Oh, lovely. Yeah, thank, oh, lovely. Thanks for thanks for having here and organized the, the meeting for that, you know, sociable hours here in the, the Southern Hemisphere. Thanks. Yeah, yeah, I guess that's, yeah, it's a, it, I have to apologize that we don't get to do more of these morning sessions. It's uh but with uh, morning sessions are obviously a bit, obviously a bit challenging for uh, for us, so we do our best. Um, and I yeah, can see Eric. Er, I can see Eric happy. If er, Eric is, is happy. happy. He's got a big smile on his face, and that's important. I'm just not going to give you any any shite at all that you deserve about pissing and moaning about having an early cup of coffee. Dear <laughs> God, what sort of field biologist are you? I know the worst, the worst kind. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I'd be pushing you outside on the bloody shed you know, before dawn just to <laughs> shut you up. <laughs> Eric, remind me never to go in the field with you. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> All right, I think we'll start off. Okay, uh, so as, as humans, we invest a huge amount of our lives into caring for our, our offspring. You know, human parents would give their lives to protect and raise their children. As a parent, I could I could attest to that. And so in some ways, it might be difficult for us to comprehend how other species could adapt different strategies that weigh more, might weigh more heavily towards, say, self-preservation. Grant, you needed to unmute, to mute everyone, I guess. There is oh, some yeah. background noise. Mute us. Mute you. Mute you. There you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Here we go. Gotcha. Um, so... So yeah, so it might seem odd for humans that there are other species that could adapt to other strategies that might weigh more heavily on their survival than the survival of their offspring. Um, so what's become clear through studying the life history of numerous species is that there's a huge spectrum, spectrum of strategies uh, that are employed, which derive, which derive from evolutionary adaptations that are best suited to the Exploring. ecological niches uh, which these animals fill. The life history theory is the framework that's used to describe these various strategies that make these trade-offs between reproductive investment um, and self-survival. So in general, short-lived species, for example, like fish, amphibians, um, will put effort into having loads of offspring as quickly as possible, loads and loads of eggs, and then they kind of bugger off. While long-lived species typically have only a few offspring and then make these trade-offs between survival and their, their current effort. These trade-offs in these long-lived species can be driven by say environmental constraints, so say poor foraging conditions, or perhaps by physiological or demographic constraints. Mm -hmm. These kind of interspecific comparisons in the literature are common, uh, particularly in some of the more historical literature. Uh, however, the interspecific comparisons of life history strategies are rarely seen in literature. Oh. Oops, sorry, I just realized that mute was off again. Mm. So <clears throat> it might seem a bit strange that some of these, um, that there are intraspecific differences within um, in, in life history, history strategies, but if you kind of consider it carefully, uh, phenotypic responses to environmental conditions between colonies, for example, are common, um, or even age, an individual's age could lead to differences in, in resource allocation. So this particular paper that we're talking about, which was actually led by Francisco Ramirez um, and co-authored by his colleagues in Australia, including Andre, uh, takes a look at this in little penguins or little blue penguins or fairy penguins, depending on what part of the world you live in, um, at a well-studied colony in Australia, Phillip Island. Now, little penguins are really cool because they reach the age of sexual maturity pretty early on, between about the ages of two and three years, and they tend to live for a very short period of time compared to other seabirds. So somewhere between seven to 14 years, depending on the uh, conditions and the study that you look at. Um, this suggests that individuals, because of this sort of like short lifespan, uh, early sexual maturity, this sort of suggests that these birds should be maximizing reproductive output. So having lots of babies. But in fact, they tend to be one of the few seabird species that will uh, kind of only have a couple of couple of offspring in a in a clutch, but then um, they, but they might attempt to re reproduce multiple times a year, and they're one of the few seabird species that do this. Um, but the success of this is often driven by environmental factors. Now, interestingly, it seems that 
with little penguins, age-related strategies to reproduction have also been identified. So meaning what we're seeing with little penguins is that they actually cut across several life history strategies. Um, now at the Phillip Island colony, little penguins breed during the austral spring. However, what's been, not what's been noted is actually there's a smaller, smaller peak of attendance um, in the autumn months, cost contrasting what occurs in other, other colonies in the area. Uh, the authors of this paper investigated if this autumn peak was considered a genuine breeding attempt. So penguins uh, have Phillip Island have been studied for many years, uh, and the authors used this um, used in this case had a, a data set extending from 2003 to 2013. It's quite an extensive data set because they use these automatic penguin monitoring systems. Um, and basically, this is a system where they have pit tags and individuals, um, and they have these platforms that the birds walk across so you get weights and, and all this so they, they they're really really carefully tracking when individuals are going and leaving from a, a coming to and leaving a colony um, using these data the authors were able to ascertain how many penguins um, were attending the colony and they were able to identify these specific spikes um, and when these spikes were starting um, so for the autumn uh, this autumn peak the authors use this threshold of at least twice the minimum number of birds recovered, recovered in March, attending for five successive days. And that's what kind of, that's what, how they define these, these peaks. Um, over the course of the study, 332 marked penguins of known age were examined with over 270,000 colony attendances over the 10 year period. Um, these attendance peaks, uh, these clearly occurred in April and May. This, this is the austral, the austral autumn, by the way. Um, with the exception of 2012. The autumn peaks coincided with um, autumn peaks in primary productivity as well. And these primary productivity peaks closely seem to match those that typically occur in the spring as well. There also seemed to be no difference in the numbers of males and females who are attending the colony during that autumn peak. And birds that were around during the autumn were on average 2.5 years older than those that only bred during the spring and summer. And actually that's that's quite stark when you look at uh, table two in the paper you actually do see very clearly that there's this there's almost no variability in the age uh, of birds in the autumn peak uh, that are around the autumn peak whereas in the spring peak you get uh, quite a lot of variability in the average age so andre um thank you again for joining us and um i have a question for you here and i'm wondering if you could uh start by elaborating for us more on why you think this August peak or this autumn peak is an actual breeding attempt. Oh, you're, you're muted there, Andre. I there can see that. Yeah, we got you now. Uh, uh, thanks. Uh, thanks for, for having me here and um and thanks for the refresher i, I couldn't remember everything you said <laughs> about this paper <laughs> very, very nice paper actually after hearing you saying the way you put it was quite nicely uh the sec the second um thing i want to say this is one of the rare papers that i haven't done with ian and akiko so it's not it's not good quality <laughs> no it, it is okay um so what happens here is that uh, every year, if you, if you live down here, every year um, people would say, oh, there's this fake breeding. And, and fake is such a fashionable word, isn't it? Um, there's a fake breeding here in autumn because it, it, we have all these penguins come in. And uh, one thing that happens that the attendance in, in autumn it's uh, is as high as the frequency is as high as in spring when they're breeding. And, and so it looks like they're going to breed and, uh, and, and they don't. And they, they call fake breeding. But then you think, you know, for, you know, what you said quite nicely about the, the life history and those birds have a sort of limited uh, source of energy available to them. Why you would put so much effort to, to do the attendance in, in autumn if you're not thinking about, about something. And, uh, and, and in autumn, they do pair and nest material and, and sometimes they lay eggs and the eggs eventually fails. 
but then we start to look at how this is compared with the, you know, the, the real breeding. And we found that every single step of the pre preparation for breeding does happen in autumn. And even the, the, the triggers that, um, that sort of uh, triggers breeding in, in spring are present in autumn, like the sea surface temperature, the increase in chlorophyll. And uh, if, you, if, you, if you work in temperate waters, you're going to see that there's two peaks of uh, productivity in, in, you know, in a sort of tech textbooks. One is in spring, which is a big one, and a, a short one in, in, in autumn. So somehow the penguins, they're actually reading that peak of productivity in autumn. And they say, okay, let's, let's see if, if we can breed. We suspect in, uh, because we've seen this every year and uh, then it's, oh, looks like they're going to breed and everything it looks like going to breed. So it must be young silly birds that they don't know what they're doing and they think, oh, let's go and breed. And, and then for our surprise, we found they actually two and a half years older. And, um, and it was very good to get, to get Fran involved in, in, in this paper. Uh, because Fran, he's, he's this little genius on you know, ecology, and uh, he put a, a nice spin, and the, the paper become as good as the papers we do with Jan and Akiko. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but, but then, we, then we thought, well, what happens there is it's exactly that um, the opposite of, of humans. So they put more effort on breeding than they own survive because we, we tend to be the opposite, um, I think. <laughs> so uh, so that, that was incredible. So it's, it's kind of the residual breeding that takes the birds to, to go that, that path. Um, we've done some, there's another work we, we've been doing and uh, separate to that, but it's relevant to what I'm saying is that um, when we look at, you know, the a, a longitudinal study on those birds since from hatching to, to, to death, and we talk about birds that they are probably 20, 22, 23 years old, um, and uh, up to that age, and then we see that spark or spike in, uh, in breeding when they get uh, after 18. So they, I think they feel like the, you know, the, the end of life is near and they put more effort in breeding. Hmm. That's quite interesting. And so <clears throat> what, what I thought was really quite cool about say table two and seeing this, like the, what, what really struck at home for me was the fact that really in that autumn peak, there's there's almost no variability across the years either with regards to the age of of breeding you look at that that first column you're seeing like loads of variability in the average age you know some years you've got <clears throat> average age is like four years or three years of you know whereas that second column so what we're i guess what we're seeing here is that basically during that autumn peak there's all there's no young birds that are breeding during that period or attempting this second breeding is that is that right we're only seeing older birds that's correct, and uh, yeah, it it is correct, and it's quite it's, it's quite uh, nice you pointed out the variability because uh, the birds we see in autumn, just to you know, if you if you're not clear, if you, the birds we see in autumn, they actually bred previous spring, right? So that is not a new set of birds. There is you know, it's just the birds that bred in spring. They breed again in autumn. But those younger birds that breed in spring, they're not coming in autumn. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, it's uh, it's um, old old birds club to breed in, in autumn. It's like a like a golf club for uh... <laughs> exactly. Young um, people are not welcome. It's like bowling. <laughs> it's like bowling. If, if you go bowling, you're young. They they kick you out. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, I, I know Eric, Eric goes bowling a lot. Yeah, he can tell us. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but uh, one thing, it, um, it's, see, uh, no, I lost my train of thought. <laughs> <It's> uh, <okay. laughs> 
<laughs> happens. I usually stop halfway through a sentence when I'm like, in, you know, mid sentence, all of a sudden my brain shuts off and then I'm off on another planet. So <laughs> yeah, that happens every day, but I, I try not to show that. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. So, so but I usually, uh, but it, well, well, okay. I remember now. <clears throat> so after we finished this paper, we, this paper was published recently, but the, as you pointed out, the data, so I spent 2013. In the last two years, we actually have birds breeding in autumn and, 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 and proceed and, and, and be successful. Right, so actually because, that, that was going to be my next question, which was whether or not you actually active, have active, actively seen any birds uh, successfully breeding in that autumn peak. But uh, in, the last, in the last two seasons at Phillip Island, we have birds breeding in autumn and they produce healthy, big, fat chicks. Wow. I used I used to call I used to call this um, uh, ABBA, like the you know the, the oh the, like ABBA the the band yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the autumn yeah yeah is the autumn uh, without the the soundtrack thank you. Uh, <laughs> so was the the autumn uh, bed breeding attempt? Uh -huh. but, but now I have to take one of the bees because they looks yeah. like they. I don't know how to say with one B about. A so it's, yeah. <laughs> so no, but it's uh, it's very interesting. And in last season, we have one of the highest breeding season ever, and thanks to the you know the, the birds in in autumn. Uh, I just want to to finish the you know this round of comments saying that um, you know uh, these birds, as you pointed out, they have double clutch, and double clutch is a sort of back to back breeding. So they breed, they, they fledge chicks. In a couple of weeks later, they breeding again, okay? But the, the, the ABBA, it's, it's the quite isolated. So you have that breeding autumn, if they continue or fail. So then they stop, then there's a, a huge gap in, in sort of winter period. Then they, they breed again in, in spring. So it's a complete different uh, sort of um, set of breeding. So it's not a double clutch, but it's, a, it's another breeding cycle within one year. Yeah. Yeah, that's, and that is really, really interesting. I have to say it's um, little, I mean, little penguins are, are already, I guess, constrained by this, this short lifespan. And it's, it's quite interesting to see that from a seabird, to see this like double breeding over the course of a year. I mean, you see it in songbirds quite a lot, but... Uh, certainly not in sea and definitely not in penguins. Um, so I, I think I'll open it up to the audience. I do have a couple other questions, but I'll, I'll leave it in case there are some other people. Um, oh, here we go. Jan has got a question, but he's he's too afraid to actually. Oh no, this is a, from Akiko, was it? Oh, Akiko has a question, but but they're too afraid to turn their uh, turn their mics off. So uh, I'm going to ask. I'm going to ask you the question, which is: Do they breed with the same partner in summer and autumn? That's the type of question that uh, take our sleep away every night, and uh, uh, we're going <laughs> we're going to uh, no one ever ask that actually. Uh, but we're going to, the, well. The answer is no. <laughs> I don't know actually. So, we, but we have to set up a project with Jan and Akiko to see if we can get some clever <laughs> student from France. Yeah. They can help us out. Yeah, that Jan, you've got a you've got a task now to find a clever student who's going to help Andre. No, it's Akiko. <laughs> oh, sorry, Akiko, you've got a mission. <laughs> um, cool. So, um, do we have any other questions from the audience out there? Eric, or Andre, can, Eric, Eric has a question. Yes. Eric does have a question. Oh, that's um, <laughs> much as I would be delighted to give Andre grief. Um, just. Out of interest, the uh, last two or three years in Tasmania, we've had lots of um, penguins on you know, breeding in autumn, and we've got egg, birds on eggs and chicks at the moment. I was up at Low Head at the northern end of Tasmania uh, three weeks ago doing a, some survey up there for the local community, and in the first hour, I think we found nine burrows with eggs and chicks. So the, the birds are definitely shifted well the perception that we have in Tasmania now is that the birds are less seasonal and less synchronous than what they were 10 or 15 years ago um, and very much uh, now 
breeding potentially any time of the year. We had a dog attack on the northwest coast of Tasmania two years ago uh, in June, and the, the park service did a search for orphan chicks, and they had a whole bunch of, um, they found 10 chicks that had been orphaned by the dog attack, and they, based on the sizes and the ages of the chicks, um, there was March and egg, March and April egg laying two years ago on the northwest coast of Tasmania. So it's very much a, uh, a phenomenon that you're seeing on Phillip Island. We don't have tag birds. We, we're just doing very basic, you know, working with community groups and keeping an eye on, an, on a number of colonies. But there's certainly autumn breeding in Tasmania um, in parallel with what you're seeing on Phillip Island. That's pretty cool. I'll, I'll take as a comment. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks, Eric. That's interesting. It just shows that your, your Tasmanian birds don't know what they're doing either. So while we've been seeing here, and, uh, and of course, not surprising that that happens elsewhere, is the birds breeding early and earlier. So it's uh, now it's, it's about, I think it's about uh, uh, 45 to 60 days earlier yeah. that yeah. they used to be when I, when I started working here, um, which is amazing. And uh, we, we did, which is nothing to do with what we're talking here, but we did this um, just a linear exercise to see what the birds are, um, how they're going to, to, to start breeding and how success they are going to be in, in the year 2100. Yeah. Yeah, and so again, this was a, a, you. You beat me to the punch on another question here, Andre, because the, the next question I had for you was about phenological changes, because uh, one of the things you postulate on in the paper is uh, um, that the uh, that this could potentially be driven partly by environmental conditions. And so I was going to ask whether or not the environmental conditions have shifted substantially enough that you're seeing phenological changes. Oh, well, and absolutely, and that's most of the work I do with. Yeah, and then Akiko, it's about this. And um, so we live in, a, in this part of the planet is one of the five spots, hot spots of the planet where the temperature of the water is, is above two degrees. So it's four times warmer here than any other way, any other place in the planet. So, and, uh, and we can see, you know, and Eric can, can mention that if he wants to, you know, there, there are things that used to be in, in the tropics, they now are in Tasmania, which is a sort of temperate uh, zone, is about uh, what's 48 degrees south. About is 42, it? 42, 48, you, you mostly wait to Macquarie Island. See, see that things how change here very fast. <laughs> <laughs> It's 42 years. Uh, so so it's, uh, it's, it's very impressive. You can see that happening here. And, uh, you know, I go into the water all the time. And, you know, our winter here is not, I buy different types of wetsuits nowadays because I don't need as, as warm as I used to. So, you know, you can, it's quite visible, the change here. And, 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 the, and it's quite visible the change in the, when the birds start breeding. Uh, we did those predictions for 2100, but uh, if you want to know the, the results, you have to watch the, <laughs> watch the World, Seabird, <laughs> World Seabird Conference on Twitter, because uh, that's the... my presentation. Oh, okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah, <laughs> Can't miss that. <laughs> Eric, you, you've got another comment. Yeah, just to, to, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, rather than putting the little icon up, um, for me, the thing that is most symbolic of the change is the fact that um, the molt now will occur as early as January. And so for me, rather than saying that they're breeding earlier or later or whatever, I think the, the because for a penguin, the key annual event, no matter what, they have to molt, whereas breeding is discretionary to some extent, molt is not. And so I think what we should be talking about as a reference point is rather than when the birds are starting, because essentially they're breeding any other time of the year now, I think we should be looking at the, the timing phenology of molt, because that's the one thing that the birds have no choice over in their life history strategy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, that's a fair point. It's very interesting. Um, I yes. just wanted to point out a comment here that was in the chat. Karen Lyle has said that, um, she she dares to say that the uh, the similar the um, 
this strategy by Let the uh, Little Penguin is very similar to the Humboldt penguins that uh, she worked with in Peru. Uh, Humboldts apparently have uh, two re reproductive peaks as well. I'm not sure if yeah. you see that in other species. I don't know if you see it in the other, in Galapagos penguins or anything like that. Galapagos penguins take me as a species that might do something like that. But uh, I think the, the, I think those are species that you know coastal and you know uh, like like penguins they not they don't migrate so they they hang around to take any, any opportunity to breed. Mm -hmm. It's not surprised. And uh, and and you leave some you know in terms of food supply is it's so so unpredictable that they they take you know any cue and any opportunity to breed because it, you know everything we talk about here it's about it's not about how penguins perceive the environment, but how the environment affects what the penguins eat. So if there's food, they breed. If there's no food, they, they don't breed. And that's as simple as that. Yeah. Very good. Mariana, do you have any questions before we sign off? I can have a last question Go for, for Andre. Ooh. Yes, Ooh. I was wondering, um, if we could see through, because you are, are now collecting a very long time series, um, and uh, if we could see an effect on the offspring. So if uh, we assume that these older animals are actually better if they are giving birth to, um, to better offsprings that will actually then perform very well as soon as they reach maturity. That's <laughs> that's another question that um, yeah gives us nightmare. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, <laughs> it's just for the uh, it's for the future. It's, it's just to push yeah, it. Yeah, uh, we, we we have this uh, we we have this uh, Mariko here recipient that's come to visit us this year, and uh, we hope that we can convince her to to analyze our data. It's at you, Mariana. <laughs> I'm laughing first. <laughs> no, no, but no, seriously, we, yeah. we do, yeah. we, we work in a project. Well, look, there's so much, so much you can do with so many exactly. questions. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, and, that's uh, also, and, and, yeah. And my, my job here, we, we're moving from, you know, uh, we're moving from, did I freeze? No. No, no. Uh, we move, yeah, so. <laughs> We move from 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 ecology to conservation biology. So, and the questions has to be more in terms of what should good do to to make sure that we secure the food supply of the penguin to the future. So, it's more in terms of apply the knowledge we have. So, and so that's why we, you know, most of my work nowadays is so, and they end out. But we have so much data and have all these interesting questions that we usually sort of pair up with someone usually much brighter than, than I am to, to answer those questions. Uh, we, we work in something, uh, in, in, I work with Ian and Akiko, um, they don't know yet, but we work in this project uh, proposal to, and we're going to incorporate that kind of question. Oh, no, can I just absolutely. add in? Can I just add one thing in case people don't know? We, we work with Andre, uh, Yanen Akiko here. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, really? Just, in, ca just no. in case people don't get the message. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. You have our deepest sympathies, Jan. Yeah. I, I know, Eric. I know. You, you have bird too in Tasmania. Can we join? <laughs> Come on down. Just, just fly straight past Melbourne. <laughs> look, look, I, I share my office with, with Eric, and uh, I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> Just, just don't turn around. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, thank you, Andre. Thank you. That was yeah. lovely. It's great, great to have you on again, and uh, hope to have you on again in the future. Of course, as you engage with more clever students from France, with with Jan and Akiko, of course. <laughs> well, I, I must say, it's not that hard to find someone clever than me. So it's not a compliment. <laughs> Alrighty, Send everyone. you an Italian this time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, with that, I will um, stop recording. Uh, hang on, but don't.